is the evening. Welcome, everybody. This is the evening that Jesus had last the Last Supper, where he washed his disciples' feet, where he uh, gave such beautiful teaching about Espiritu Santo, about Holy Spirit. And really, John, John 13 to 17 would be a great passage of Scripture for you to read uh, in the Passion Translation, of course. <laughs> Read it in any Bible, and uh, you're you're really tapping into the last night of Jesus' mm-hmm. life. That's traditionally what over one billion people around the world are celebrating tonight, or commemorating, I should say, not just Passover. This is Passover week for our Jewish friends, but we as believers in Yeshua, we are stepping right into Good Friday tomorrow. Uh, and all of that. So if you don't mind everybody uh, muting your microphone, (laughs) there you go. Oh, Brian, you're muted. One more time. All right. You should be able to hear me. Uh, Is the volume okay? Everything okay? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being in the Zoom room. And uh, we're going to be welcoming all of our Facebook uh, friends. I'm sorry, YouTube. Those will be viewing on YouTube as well. So I really like doing the Zoom class because I get to see you. I see Terry. Uh, Terry Carson, hello. Good to see you all. Sabrina, Judy, uh, Annette. Uh, if you would be so kind uh, and you're able, you're dressed and in your right mind, then go ahead and unmute your video and join us here in the Zoom room. Hi, Kara. Good to see you as well. And welcome, welcome. Thank you all for being a part of this live class, Drawing Near to God. So if you're new, if this is your first time with us, welcome. Uh, Feel free to unmute your video and join in as we uh, see one another connect on this level. Uh, We have one more live class after this one in the series that we've been doing on Draw Near to God. I've been teaching on the song of the ages, the greatest song ever composed. And it wasn't uh, by any of your favorite uh, worship leaders. It was by Solomon, the song of the ages, the greatest song of all, known as the Song of Solomon. And uh, we've been going through some of this tonight. If you have Passion Translation, maybe you have the Song of Songs, or you have the entire New Testament. It includes the Song of Songs. And you can go to chapter four, and uh, you'll be ready to go. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you so much for these wonderful friends taking this live class, we ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would fall upon our hearts like dew. Where we have been stiff and hard, would you soften us, tenderize us? Where we've been unyielding or stubborn, would you convince us tonight of your great love? We ask for glory to be transmitted through this Zoom uh, class, and I ask that every heart would be thrilled with what we hear tonight. Thank you, Father. May your blessing be upon each one in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming, guys. <clears throat> so, uh, Jesus has a wedding. Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, it's not good for the Son of Man to be alone. He determined that he would find a people that he would wed. Now, when we use these terms, we're not thinking in in the natural. We're thinking of a supernatural, spiritual union between human beings and the Trinity. And Jesus is the prototype. He's the firstborn of many. He is our forerunner. He brings many sons to glory and daughters to glory. Isn't that wonderful that you're being, being brought to glory? You're on a journey into the glory of God. Wow. Our God, 
than his great love for us as expressed through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we're in Passion Week. Uh, those of you that may watch the replay, we're recording this on Thursday evening, uh, known as Monday Thursday. This is the, the day. Monday comes from the Latin word referring to uh, the washing of feet. This was when Jesus washed his disciples' feet. And may he wash our feet and renew our hearts and do something powerful in our lives as we share this brief time this evening together. But the glory of God expressed in his love, you're never going to be loved like you are loved by Jesus Christ. And the real meaning of life is to discover more. Just because you can spell it in English, L-O-V-E, doesn't mean you know what it really is. And that know-it-all spirit has to be broken off the Western church. We know so little about the love of God because it's past finding out the height, the width, the length, the depth. Who has ever fathomed the depths of the love of God? I think that's why it will take eternity to unveil the layer after layer of God's exquisite love for us. So the journey of the believer is a journey into the affections of God, into the heart level, heart deep fellowship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. And it's not good for the son of man to be alone. And he has chosen a bride from all the nations. He chose you. Before you were even born, he chose you to be a part of the bridal company, this bridal theology that is going to cover the earth in the last days. I'm excited to share more about that with you this evening. Welcome. If you've just tuned in, uh, you're in the right spot. You're going to be right on the bullseye of the love arrows of God. How does it feel to be the Valentine of Jesus Christ? How does it feel to be the lookalike partner of the Son of God, soon to be unveiled in radiance, splendor, uh, matching your, your beloved, your bridegroom? Wow, I think it feels pretty good. I love it. I love teaching this. I love talking about it. So thank you guys again for tuning in. So the uh, wedding day of Jesus was the day he was nailed to a cross. Please listen. There's one time when Jewish men would wear a crown. It was their wedding day. They literally wore a crown. A Jewish male on his wedding day would wear a crown. And Jesus' crown, which his mother gave him, was the crown of thorns. Jesus wore the crown of thorns for he was a king, and he was a king coming to his wedding day. I know this is language that you may not have considered before, but I'm convinced this week I did a deep dive into the cross and to the, the Jewish wedding symbolism, and I'm convinced that when Jesus was nailed to that tree, he stepped into the wedding bliss of his eternal bride. That is the joy that was set before him. Not only the crown, but a Jewish male was dressed as the high priest at his wedding. He wore a tunic. He would wear a seamless tunic. Now, when the entire Bible comes out, I have already added like a huge footnote for, John, for uh, Song of Songs chapter 3, where Jesus was crowned. He wore the crown on his wedding day in John, in Re I'm sorry, Song of Songs chapter 3, the crown his mother gave him for the day of his wedding. And I've got an extensive footnote that you're going to really want to see when the entire Bible comes out. But the other thing the Jewish male would wear as a bridegroom was a tunic, like the high priest, and it would, would seamless. It was a seamless tunic. The high priest and Jesus both wore seamless tunics. They could not split his garment because it was woven top to bottom with no seam. And in the same way, a Jewish bridegroom was dressed as the high priest and a king with a crown. There's something about this wedding that was, in, in, in essence, 
was fulfilled at the cross. When he said it's finished, I think it has to do with the wedding ceremony. And, of course, you know finished, kala, the Hebrew word finished, completed, is Jesus did not say tetelestai on the cross. Tetelestai is the Greek word finished. It is finished. Uh, actually, it is is not in the text. It's just the word tetelestai, finished, completed, consummated. Well, the Hebrew word for that is kala. And kala, I'm convinced, was the last word Jesus spoke on the cross. You can check this out, John 19.30, in my footnote. Kala is a, Jewish, is a Hebrew homonym that can also be translated bride. I believe the last word Jesus spoke on the cross was bride. I'm not taking it is finished away from you because I'm a it is finished preacher. Bro, I believe it's finished, that works of men cannot add one bit to what Jesus did on the cross for us. It is finished. It's a finished, completed work. However, it's the word bride. That was his wedding day. Now, the consummation of this wedding will be what we call eternity, the mountains of spice, the eternal honeymoon. Think of your life ever after as a honeymoon that never ends. Oh, my. Oh, my. Oh, you're going to get me talking in tongues, and I'll probably offend a Baptist, but I'm telling you, this is getting me so excited. Woo! Oh, oh. Oh, more, Lord. Let it hit every single viewer tonight that we were included in the wedding feast. You wore the wedding garment on the cross with a crown, a garland of thorns to show us your great love. It was a bride that you took at Calvary. Thank you, Father. So now, Song of Songs 4. Wow. Song of Songs 4 <clears throat> says, oh, I got to get composed here. Every part of you, I'm, I'm looking at verse, um, verse 7. He says over your life tonight, every part of you is so beautiful, perfect your beauty without flaw within, flawless. Everybody in Zoom land say, he sees me flawless. Uh, I can't hear you, but I trust, I trust you're saying that. Your dog can hear you at least. Uh, he sees me flawless. You are flawless. Every accusing spirit, whether human or demon, that comes against you, they do not know who you are in God's eyes. You are flawless. There remains no more condemning voice of accusation. The gavel has dropped. The verdict has been read. You are not only not guilty, you are blameless, flawless, without sin, without flaw, my love. You are totally, in his eyes, who you will be forever. He sees things that are not as though they are. He speaks them forth. He calls you beautiful before you even feel the slightest beauty within. He looks into your heart, and he sees a teeny sprout of virtue, a teeny sprout coming up through the soil of your life, and he calls that a fruitful garden. He calls it an orchard of delight. He calls it the garden of Eden paradise. You haven't done anything. You haven't really done much, nor have I. But he looks in your heart and mine and says, I like that. You are my paradise garden. You are my Eden bliss. You are the cup of bliss that I lift to my lips every time you worship me. I draw it up. I inhale. <laughs> Jesus inhales, and he brings your worship into his spirit, and it ravishes his heart. Whew. Now you are ready, my bride. You weren't ready in chapter one. You were all upset with the angry bros that make you take care of their vineyards. You're, you're all frustrated with church life. You're all focused on the natural. It's chapter two, he came leaping over mountains and he started drawing you closer. And you go, so you made a, a step closer, but you still wouldn't go with him up the mountain trail. Chapter three, you got the revelation of the marriage carriage, the palanquin that he would carry you. 
You don't have to claw your way up the trail, up the mountain. He would carry you. You see, grace carries you where the law cannot take you. Where your obedience ends, his grace begins. I'm telling you. Oh, ma, you married up. Anyway, you're ready now to climb with me the highest peaks together. We will look down. Oh, come with me through the archway of trust. That is the Hebrew word amana, amana. And that's where we get the word amen. And it's the word faith or trust. The archway of trust, the hupa, the, the wedding a canopy. Come into this. Live with me in the wedding bliss that I extended to you at the cross and in my empty tomb. And Come with me through that archway of trust, and we will look down on our foes. We'll look down from the hot heavenly realm upon the lion's den and the leopard's lair. We'll wage spiritual warfare in the heavenly realm looking down, not just pounding on demon spirits here on earth. We will wage war together. So for the first time, there's an, uh, there's an implication that the bride has combat boots on that this chick is wearing combat boots. She's made as a warring bride. You know, that, that reminds me, uh, Chayil, the Hebrew word Chayil, and you have it in Proverbs 31, the virtuous woman, that is the word Chayil, the Chayil woman. Well, listen, ladies and gentlemen, virtuous is the most tepid translation you could ever find for that word Chayil. That's used for David's mighty men. As a matter of fact, Chayil means mighty like an army. That girl's not virtuous. She is like stunning, like you're going to get the kajibi scared out of you. You know, he's going to scare the daylights into you when the bride is unveiled. This is not a Mother's Day sermon. I'm sorry. Proverbs 31 has been misused, misread, and even hung over women. It is not a Mother's Day sermon. Chayil is a warring bride. It is a prophecy and a parable of the last day's bride emerging. Yes, read the footnotes in Proverbs 31, and I've, I've got 40 of them to prove to you that it's a parable of the last day's church, which is an army, which is a bride, which is a warring bride, which is an army. So, all right, we'll look down, we'll wage war together, the lion's den, the leopard's lair, for listen, for you reach into my heart, you have ravished my heart with one glance of your eyes. One glance. One glance of love when you are depressed, beaten up, uh, rejected, feeling insecure and incomplete, when you turn away from that and worship the one you don't even see yet, you move his heart so powerfully that he uses that word ravish. You have ravished my heart. You reach into my heart with a glance. My, my, my. I'm undone by your love, my beloved, my equal, my bride. You leave me breathless. Phew. I'm overcome by a glance of your worshiping eyes. The word overcome is the word Rahab. Yeah. You have Rahab the heart of Jesus. You Rahabbed him. Rahab, did she have anything to overcome? You betcha. She had to overcome what the women thought of her, what the men thought of her, what the king thought of her, all of the people of Jericho. Rahab ended up marrying into the family line, the genealogy of Jesus Christ. She married a Jewish man who we believe was one of the two spies that was sent. His name was Salmon, S-A-L-M-O-N, Salmon. He's a little fishy, but he was a good guy. He's a good guy. So Salmon and Rahab end up in the genealogy of Jesus. Okay, that's what you do to him. You overcome. You bust through. You're overcomer. You conquer the conqueror with a glance of your eyes. If you conquer the mighty conqueror, it makes you more than a conqueror. That's who you are. On this Passion Week, as we, uh, you know, I hope you'll worship with brothers and sisters 
in, in a body and take communion this weekend and and worship Jesus, the resurrected King. But don't don't detour around the cross. Stare at it, ponder it, receive light and revelation from the glory of the cross, and it'll make the resurrection even more more tremendous. Everybody okay in Zoom land? Okay, let's keep going. For you have stolen my heart. You've stolen my heart. Uh, and I, I have a footnote in here that that is the word uh, libabthini, libabthini. And libabthini can mean a lot of different things. I've shared this before. I've shared it really many times if you've taken my Song of Songs teaching. And it, it really comes from an ancient Semitic word that, that is to strip the bark off of a tree. And Jesus is saying, your love does that to me. You make me vulnerable. A tree that has lost its bark is vulnerable. It's wounded. You have wounded me. Your love wounds me. I know you may feel lovesick, but I am lovesick around you because your passionate glance of love conquers me. It, it overwhelms me. It, I, it, I'm held hostage by your love. I'm joined to you in a supernatural way as we worship, as you worship me, my Father, and my and the Spirit. You have truly overcome. You have truly conquered my heart. That's what you do to Jesus. Oh, my. How satisfying to me, my equal, my bride. Your love is the finest wine, intoxicating and thrilling. It, look, if you can't draw near to God with the Song of Songs, whoo, something's not, you're not firing on all eight cylinders. I guess it's four now, but something's not right in your heart. You, you're, you're bound, friend. But when you hear these words, you see the way Jesus matures and, and, and beautifies the bride is with love. Churches do it with angry preaching at times. Exhortation. Exhortation is good. We need to be stirred up. I get it, you know, but so many times that's all we get in, in, in churches. And may the Lord release uh, 10,000 messengers to preach the Song of Songs, to teach the revelation of love. This is what matures the bride, not telling her what she's not, but telling her who she is, telling her who she really is. You've heard me say it. Jesus puts a crown on your head. Then he watches you grow up to fit it. His words beautify us, change us. The words of men, we soon forget them. I mean, I don't know if any of you know what your pastor spoke on last Sunday. But the words of Jesus, they linger. They live deep inside the echo the, the vibration and the echo of the revelation of Jesus' heart, it lives in us. Wow. Okay. Your love is my finest wine, intoxicating and thrilling. Your sweet, perfumed praises, so exotic, so pleasing. Your loving words are like honeycomb to me. Under your tongue is found milk and honey. Milk and honey flows two places, in your heart and in the promised land. Maybe your heart is his promised land. You are the promised land, the promised inheritance. You're the reward of the Father. The Father rewarded the Son for his, his loving faithfulness by giving him you. You are the love gift to Jesus. You're the wedding. <laughs> the price of blood was paid for you, and the Father wrapped you up in flesh, gave you life on this planet, and said, you're going to live, and you're going to be a love gift to my son, Jesus Christ, a worthy gift, a worthy gift. And so you are worthy. Your worth is attached to the blood of Jesus. Never look at yourself apart from the blood of Jesus, because God never does. God has eternal thoughts towards you, thoughts to give you a hope, a future, thoughts to prosper you, to bless you, to encourage you, to move you closer to his heart. 
And if and yes, there's ups and downs, there's hills and valleys. I get it. I, I we've my wife and I have gone through the last six, seven months, six months or so, uh, 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 you know, difficulty. And some of you know what I'm talking about, but we, we have walked through a pain. We've walked through issues that have really tested our love and, and moved us closer to God's heart. Listen, anything that brings you closer to God is a blessing. If that sorrow, if that pain, if that thing you had to go through brings you closer to God, just put the word blessing over it and move on. God bless me. He brought me closer. He drew me closer. Draw me closer, Lord Jesus. You've asked him to draw you, and you would run. Well, sadly, he comes and he draws us, but we don't like the invitation. We don't like the package that invitation comes in. And we say, but that doesn't, how could that make me closer to you, God? Well, just step out, take his gift, and watch it happen. He's going to draw you so close. You are going to look in the mirror not long from now, and you're going to say to yourself, I don't know who you are anymore. I don't even recognize you. You're so different. You're not moved by all the dinky, dorky stuff. Those are Hebrew words. You're you're moved by his heart. You're, You're being tenderly drawn closer. You can't get away with arguing and angry words and those fits of rage and temper tantrums and impatience and criticism and slander. You can't get away. The Holy Spirit has you on a short leash. Thank God. And he's changing you. What has changed you? Guilt-driven theology? Angry exhortation? You gotta, you better, you have to? No. Kiss. When you deserve a lecture, he kisses you. When you're at your worst, grace kisses you, and kindness leads you out of that thing, leads you into, of course, repentance. and uh, uh, Metanoia, the Greek word repentance, I'll tell you exactly what it means, and it's not what you've been taught. Meta, isn't there an organization, a company out there called Meta right now? Yeah. Meta is supernatural. It, it's above. It's transcendent. And you're going past what's normal. Meta. It, it's like the metaverse. Okay? Every verse in the Bible is a metaverse. Okay? Meta means to go higher above. Noia is thinking or mind. It's not a new mind. It's a transcendent mind. It's a mind in the heavenly realm. And that's what kindness leads us into transformed thinking, into a renewed mind, a mind that is engaged with the heavenly realm. Well, Joanne, you come back and join us some other time, maybe next week. She's just signing off here. Okay. I love this Zoom thing. I can like talk to you guys. You're kind of quiet tonight. It's kind of quiet here in this. Methodist church gathering we've got. That's all right. All right. Hang on. So milk and honey. Two things flow with milk and honey, your heart and the promised land. What do milk and honey have? uh, What do they have in common? Have you ever thought about this? Milk is the formation of, of the joining of two kingdoms, animal kingdom and plant kingdom. That's where milk comes from. Uh, I'm sounding so brilliant here tonight. Uh, Cow eats grass, makes milk. All right. So grass, plant kingdom, cow, animal kingdom, the merging of two kingdoms produces a substance. What about honey? Same thing. Bee, a flower. And the mingling of two kingdoms produces milk and honey. Okay. Let's connect the dots. God and man. Milk and honey under your tongue and your heart. You're everything that pleases the Father when you worship Him, when you delight your heart in Him. Milk and honey flows from inside of you. It flows right up into His heart, and He loves it that way. 
the fragrance of your worshiping love surrounds you with robes of white, scented robes of white. My darling bride, my private paradise fastened to my heart, a secret spring no one else can have. My bubbling fountain hidden from view. What a perfect partner to me now that I have you. Your inward life is sprouting, bringing forth fruit. What a beautiful paradise unfolds within you. When I'm near you, I smell aromas of the finest spice. For many clusters of my exquisite fruit now grow in your inner garden. Pomegranates of passion. Pomegranates are symbols of emotion. The, the blushing pink pomegranate, the halves of a pomegranate is our cheeks, he says. And it's our emotional life. It's through our face, our countenance that we reveal our emotions. Sad, mad, bad, glad. You can tell it from a person's face. Pomegranates of passion. Henna. Oh, my. Henna is a Hebrew homonym for atonement. The blossoms of henna. Chapter 1. She held henna over her heart all night long. Remember? Bouquet of henna. Spikenard. That's nard. Spikenard. Well, that's what Mary poured out at Jesus' feet. Saffron, shining. Fragrant calamus. Calamus is a reed. It's a picture of the uprightness. Uh, you can take the reed as an emblem of Jesus, and that broken reed he will not break. break. That bent over reed he will not crush. So much stuff in here, guys. I, I'm, I'm just kind of rolling through this. Sacred cinnamon, glory to God. Branches of scented wood. Ooh, Norwegian wood, I don't know. I love this. Myrrh, like tears from a tree coming out of you and me. Aloes as eagles ascending. The aloe is called eagle wood. Another name for aloe is eagle wood. You're a fountain of gardens. I'm telling you, drop the mic. You are a fountain, not of water. You're gardens. Shaba baranda. Gardens are pouring out of you. Gardens, plural. A fountain of gardens. Whoa. A well of living water springs up from within you like a mountain brook flowing into my heart. Awake, or oh north wind. She says, she cries, she intercedes, says, if I'm your garden, then may the wind blow. May the north wind. The word north is the same word for hidden. The hidden ways of God. The secrets of God. And the south wind, the, ple the pleasing, refreshing breeze. The south wind and the north wind. May they swirl and may they... May they blow upon the garden of my heart. Spare nothing. Stir up the sweet spice of your life within me. <clears throat> Spare nothing as you make me your fruitful garden. Hold nothing back until I release your fragrance. Come walk with me as you walked with Adam in your garden paradise. Come taste the fruits of your life in me. Blow upon the garden of my heart. Oh, my. Why don't you say that right now? Say it where I can hear it. Blow upon the garden of my heart. Oh, that's okay. By faith, I believe you said it. Blow upon the garden of my heart. Let the wind blow. Let You know, the wind is the breath, the coolness, the breath. You know, when it says in, in Genesis that God walked with Adam in the cool of the day, and eh, wrong translation. That's not the way it should be translated. It is the ruach of the day, the spirit of the day, the, the, the breath of the day, the wind of the day. God and Adam walked in the wind. They were wind walkers and wind talkers together. They were, they were in a union so beautiful. I believe Adam was translated from one location to another. That's the only way you can care for a garden that like covers half a dozen nations. He was a supernatural being created in the image and likeness. And God says in grace, we're going to, Romans 5, we'll have much, much more than what Adam lost. We're going to be restored to so much glory. 2 Peter 1, 4, we will partake of the Godhead. My, no one knows what that means 
fully to share and partake of the Godhead. Oh, there's so much to consider. Oh. Then he responds, I've gathered from your heart, my equal, my bride. I've gathered from my garden all my sacred spices, even my myrrh. Myrrh is suffering love. I've tasted, enjoyed my wine within you. I've tasted with pleasure my pure milk, my honeycomb, the honeycomb, which you yield to me. I delight in gathering my sacred spice, all the fruits of my life I have gathered from within you. She is now the bride of fragrance, of fruitfulness. She has now matured in chapter five. This girl, is she's not the angry gal on the mountain, you know, asking that he would come and kiss her. Now they have walked together. She has responded, yes. She said yes to the mountain of myrrh. She's willing to climb Calvary with her beloved, the mountain of suffering love. The mountain of myrrh is the cross. She's willing to be co-crucified, co-buried, co-raised. She said yes to all the cocoa. She's going to drink of that, and she's going to become one with him. And that delights your beloved. So he, he like turns to everybody and he says, come, everybody, my friends, all of you, you revelers of my palace, feast on her. When you drink of her love, you are tasting of me. She is now so full of the life of Jesus that she becomes like him. Oh, for every city on earth to have a Shulamite. If every, within every church family, there was a Shulamite. Just one that would be a feast. I, I know this may be coming in terms you're not used to thinking or hearing, but friends, the love feast, you're going to be the love feast to the nations, to the lost. They're going to come and, and and you're going to give them you're going to give them the, the the wine of his love the milk and honey the paradise of the bliss you share with Jesus it's not just for you and that's what we're going to find out in chapter 7 it's just not for you honey it is for the world it's for the nations she's going to go to the vineyards uh, uh, far away, the faraway lands, and she's going to plant churches, and she's going to show him her love in difficult labor and difficult ministry. She's going to reveal his love uh, even in the trials and maybe martyrdom that she goes through, but she's going to demonstrate that love out to the vineyards to see that if the vineyards are in bloom. I'm getting ahead of myself, so let's go finish chapter 5. Wowzers, drink and drink, feast on her, my lovers, drink and drink and drink again. Wow, until you can take no more. Take all you desire, you priests. My life within her will be your feast. Curtain falls on that beautiful, beautiful scene. And now we have. Uh, five-second intermission, three-second maybe, and then the curtain rises, and here she is in bed again. She was on the couch, and she was in, in chapter three. She was, uh, you know, tossing and turning on her bed of the dark night, but now she says, I let my devotion slumber, but my heart for him stayed awake. I had a dream. I dreamed of my beloved. He was coming to me in the darkness of night. Follow this. The melody of the man I love awakened me. I heard his knock at my heart's door as he pleaded with me, arise, my love. Open your heart, my darling, deeper still to me. Will you receive me this dark night? This is Gethsemane, friends. He's saying to her, will you not watch with me one hour? This is the Gethsemane man. This is the suffering Savior. He's coming to her. 
He's knocking at an inconvenient time when we're drowsy, sleepy, like the disciples that slept in the garden while Jesus prayed. And we surely can't blame them. We've done the same thing countless times. But he's coming to awaken her to pray. He wants a partner. He wants an intercessor. Our magnificent intercessor is Jesus. And if you're going to marry him, you're going to become an intercessor. There's no way around it. Uh, your intercessory life is uh, paramount to your spiritual life. And to pray, to intercede, to give, to be spent, to spend and be spent for the one you love. So there's no one else but you, my friend, my equal. That's the fifth time he said that to her. I need you this night to arise and come be with me. You are my pure, loyal dove, a perfect partner for me, my flawless one. Will you arise? And he's saying to you, beloved, tonight, will you step in to Gethsemane with your Lord? Will you be with him? Will you be his partner? Will you become a prayer partner to the Son of God? That's what he's after. A bride that will pray with him. A partner that will go to the mountains, go to the nations, and be spent as he was spent for others. Wow, what a challenge, what a call. And he doesn't say, you lazy thing, get off your bed. You know, what are you doing? I'm out here praying all night and you're asleep. Get up. What are you doing, lazy bones? No. He says, my dove, my flawless one. You see how he appeals to us in the language of love? After you're drenched in the Song of Songs imagery, you won't be manipulated by guilt-driven theology. You can't be moved anymore by, by just teachings that, tell you what you're not and just are like smack in the face. It, it, it doesn't move you anymore because what changes the heart, not for a moment, not just changing a momentary behavior pattern, but what changes the heart is love. It's transforming. You don't need to hear angry sermons anymore. You need a deeper revelation of the love of God. And when you know this love, you will do anything. You will lay it down. There's nothing you will hold back. Lovers go a lot farther than workers. Lovers, there's no price that's too great to pay. Counting the cost was only for the novice, only the beginner. The mature don't count the cost because there's no cost worth counting anymore. Nothing can be compared. If you were to give everything you had for this love, it's not even a sacrifice. It's only the, those who first start to walk with Jesus that he says count the cost. But the mature, there's no longer a count. You're not doing math anymore. You've pledged your head for heaven. You've given it all. The last drop. You go to the cross with him if that's what it means to be one with Jesus. My heaviness and tears are more than I can bear. I've spent myself for you throughout the dark night. His head is da damp, drenched with the dew of the night. Who, who is this? It's the one who prayed all night in the garden. It, this is Gethsemane. This is the one who interceded for your love, for your partnership to join himself to you. Wow. And she says, well, I've already laid aside my garments. Yeah, she's already set aside self-righteous, that self-righteous garment, the robe of self-righteousness. I've laid that aside. How can I take it up again? I, I've, I've yielded my righteousness to yours. I've, I've washed my feet. That You know, like Peter, she, she had her feet washed. Do I have to go and get them dirty again? Is what she's saying. Isn't it enough that I walk in fellowship with you? What more do you want, Jesus? Well, he wants a partner. And, and you know, when you marry somebody, I, I'm sure this is not news to anybody that's married, but when you marry somebody, dude, you're stuck. You, you go where they go, and you're basically, ah, 
you, th no choice except for where you're going to eat dinner, right? But the uh, life of Christ, there, there's, he's always taking you deeper. There's always something more. There's the more of his heart that he wants to unveil. There's the more of the sacred love that he wants to bring to you. My spirit, oh, my beloved reached into me to unlock my heart. The core of my inner being trembled at his touch. My soul melted when he spoke to me. My spirit arose to open for more of his touch. I began to sense his fragrance, the fragrance of myrrh. The sense of myrrh flowing all through me. But, but you know, we would say, alas, or I opened my soul to my beloved, but suddenly he was gone. All my heart was torn out and longing for him. That's literally from the Hebrew. My heart was torn out with longing for him. Wow. I sought his presence, his fragrance, but could not find him anywhere. I called out for him, yet he did not answer. I'll arise and search. Remember chapter three, she did the same thing. So she goes out to the city. She goes out to the church again, because the church is a city set on a hill. And she goes back into the church to find him. The overseer stopped me as they made their rounds. In chapter three, they were the good guys. In chapter five, they're controllers. They beat me and bruised me until I could take no more. They wounded me deeply. My, is this the testimony of some people that have been on the killing fields of the church? And I love the church, guys. I mean, I've planted churches. I go to church. I pastor churches. I speak at churches. Churches are us. I'm totally pro bride of Christ, church of Jesus Christ, body of Christ, however you want to describe it. But there, there is some insecurity in leaders that cannot handle. A Saul can never handle a David being raised up. And the control, the, the jealousy kicks in. We need to have a whole movement called Who Let the Sheep Out? Ha huh, ha. Huh. Who Let the Sheep Out? Nevertheless, you brides-to-be, make me this promise. If you find my beloved, tell him I endured all travails for him. I've been pierced through by love, and I still will not be turned aside. She's saying to the ladies in waiting, the daughters of Jerusalem, look, if you find him, go find him. And if you find him, tell him, I'm not turning back. Tell him I may be bruised and wounded and hurt, but I'm not going to give up on him. Never. I will never give up on him. Wow. And the, the gals that are all around him, the, I call them brides-to-be, because they're going to be the Shulamite by the end of the book, as they see how Jesus, how the king treats the maiden. They're going to cry out for that kiss, and that cycle begins all over again. Let him kiss me. But they say, what love is this? How could you continue to care so deeply for him? Isn't there another who could steal away your heart? Can't you find another lover? He left you, and the people he put over you hurt you. What kind of guy is this? You're so beautiful, you'll find another. No. She's, they say to her, what makes your beloved better than any other? Uh-oh, you better hang on to your hat, baby. Hang on to your Easter bonnet. What is it about him that makes you ask us to promise you this? What do you see in him that is beyond everybody else? He alone is my beloved. He shines in dazzling splendor, yet is so approachable. He's radiant and ruddy. Radiant is his deity. Ruddy is his humanity. He's approachable. He's shining in glory. He's dazzling. He is radiant. But yet I can come as a friend. I can come as an intimate to him. I can come and be alone with him. 
and 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 I can trust him and he can trust me. We have a, a, a relationship that goes beyond anything human. Radiant and ruddy, the two natures of Jesus, dust and deity have mingled. He shines in splendor without equal as he stands above all others, outstanding among 10,000, the fairest of 10,000. Oh, you want to know what I think about Jesus? Well, just sit down for a while because he is glorious, spectacular, tenderhearted to me. He's patient. He's put up and endured with my wandering heart. He's loved me through thick and thin. He's walked me through the 51 years that I've been a believer, taken my hand, and carried me through a life in the jungle and then life in the concrete jungle of Connecticut. He's stood with me when my critic's voice seemed so loud. He's, he's been there. He stands above. There's no one you can compare. What are you going to compare? Who will you compare Jesus to? No one. He's outstanding among 10,000. You fill a stadium with your favorite prophets, pastors, gurus, life coaches, all your evangelists and Zoom call leaders. Fill a stadium full of them. Jesus will stand above every single one of them combined. There's nobody that can compare to our Lord Jesus. Can I get an amen in Zoom land and YouTube land? Yes, yes, yes. Then it says his, his head is purest gold. That's his leadership. The way he guides me, it's, it's so beautiful. He wears a crown of gold and his hair is wavy, black as a raven. You know, it's, it's, he's young. He's the ancient of days, but he's not old. He's not wore out, believe me. He's the ancient of days. That just means he's been around a long time, but he's not old. His hair is black and wavy, the opposite of mine. Thin and fallen out and gray. But he, he don't worry. I may disappoint you. I never would want to do that. But Jesus will never disappoint. He's energetic. He's effervescent. He's youthful. And the dew of his youth will come upon you. He sees everything with pure understanding. His eyes are washed with milk, nurturing love. His eyes see what others don't. People lock onto your flaws. It's, it's like that's all they see is wh what you did how many years back. You know, and they remember that. God, Jesus never does. He never treats you according to that baloney. That's another Hebrew word. His eyes rest upon the fullness of the river of revelation, so clean and pure. Looking at his face, I see the fullness of emotion, the fullness of grace. Like a lovely garden where fragrant spices grow, what a man. No one speaks words. His lips are anointed with grace. Honey drips from his mouth. Everything he speaks is tenderhearted. It, it's sweet and sour at the same time as something potent about it, but there's something when you yield to it, it's something so sweet. It's the honeycomb. The words of Jesus are sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. Psalm 19, ever true, ever pure, never failing are his promises for you and me. Looking at his radiant face, such fullness of emotion, no one speaks words as anointed as this one that both pierce and heal. They wound us and heal us at the same time. His hands hold omnipotent power. His arms are like rods of gold. His arms, that's his actions, his strength. The, when he stretches out his arm, it, it accomplishes glorious things. It reveals the deity of Jesus. And his, his legs, it says, it goes on, it says his his legs are pillars of marble. Uh, you're not going to break them. That's why they came to Jesus to break his legs. They didn't break. They couldn't break legs of marble. I'm telling you, his, he stands upright. His ways are strong, pure, holy. It, it's beautiful. Everything he does, the way he expresses himself, the way he's treated you over the last how many years, and it's been perfect. His, he calls us flawless, but I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, he is flawless. The way he has dealt with you tenderly, lovingly, 
is flawless. You'll never have an oops with God. You'll never, you know, Jesus go, oops, I don't know what happened. I guess I was busy with taking care of Brian over here. He's keeping me so busy. I, 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 I dropped the ball with you. No, never, never, never. Oh, gosh. Sweeter his kisses, whispers of love, delightful in every way, perfect from every viewpoint. You'll always find a flaw, no matter what human you look at. If you look at uh, your favorite person long enough, you will find something wrong, but not with Jesus. He's all together lovely. Uh, divide him in a thousand pieces, and every one of those are diamonds. Flawless. And then combined, it, it's astounding. If you ask me why I love him so, brides-to-be, it's because there's none like him to me. Everything about him fills me with holy desire, and now he's my beloved, my friend forever. And guess what they say in response? Uh, 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 where can we find him? They first said, what is it about him that's so wonderful? And when you're able to share with people who this Jesus really is, they're going to say to you, uh, I want him too. Where can I find him? How can I find this man? A savior, redeemer, a lamb that's a lion, that's a king, that is a bridegroom, a high priest that carries me and is moved. He is moved by the feeling of my weaknesses. And you're not supposed to go by feelings. He does. He goes by your feelings. The feeling of your weakness moves the heart of your magnificent high priest. Never has there been a human being like him. He is the God man. He's the 200% human. He's God and man mingled, joined. He dispenses something so glorious. And to talk about him reveals his glory, and it draws him near. You want to know what I think about Jesus? You just heard it. And then they say, well, where is your beloved that we could follow him to? Just then he manifests. And I can't wait to tell you how and where to be continued. This concludes our, our live class for tonight. And next Thursday will be our final one. I, anybody believe in miracles? I believe a miracle will happen. I think I can do three, you know, six, seven, and eight. I'm going to have to do it in one, one hour. But uh, I hope you'll, if you want more of this revelation of Jesus, and if you want more of this, uh, I don't know how to say it, the, the, what God has put inside of my heart, my wife and I, in our journey, we've recorded so many classes, courses, and teachings on Ephesians, Psalms, Isaiah, on and on. And we make them available to our partners, our ministry partners. And if you'd like to have more, if, if, if this really interests you, I'm not going to, I'm not, this is no high pressure sell at all. I'm going to so soft sell it for you. If you have an interest, to go deeper in mentoring with Candace and me, Candace and I, yeah, Candace with, no, Candace. Anyway, I'll figure it out. Uh, go to passionandfire.com. Somebody put it in the chat. Now I, I won't be able to sleep tonight till I get the grammar right. Here I am a linguist, but dude, I almost got kicked out of English class in eighth grade when I was learning all this stuff. I was so bad, so bad. Uh, I'm amazed that I got through school. Um, and became a linguist? Are you kidding? Okay, is it Candace and me or Candace and I? But either way, uh, passionandfire.com forward slash partner mentoring. I see some of our partners. You're on here tonight. We love you. I saw Carolyn. Carolyn, are, is that your intercessory group there in uh, in Racine, Wisconsin? Is that you, Carolyn? Glory. Well, welcome all you beautiful friends at Racine, Wisconsin, that are in Carolyn's upper room there. Um, thank you for being a part of this class. I hope you'll all uh, consider that. 
passionandfire.com forward slash partner mentoring. We love you, friends. Wow. I've been faithful to stop right on time. Uh, love you so much, guys. I hope you have a beautiful Easter and celebrate the, the resurrection of our Lord. But don't bypass tomorrow. Don't bypass detour around the cross. Stop and ponder the wounds of Jesus Christ and step into the fellowship of that suffering, his suffering for you. Father, bless each one. <clears throat> I ask that this would be an Easter of miracles, a resurrection celebration. Let our churches be packed. Let salvation flow like a river. Let there become a, a move of the Spirit that breaks loose among the Gen Z, the Gen X, the millennials, the boomers, and, and whatever generation we're leaving out. Let each one of us experience resurrection glory this weekend, move deeply in our hearts, bring our families together in love and bonds of peace and, and sacred bonds of, of love for each other through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We ask these things. Amen and amen. Bless you guys. Have a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you. Don't forget to tell everybody, be here, be there, or be square next Thursday night, same time, same channel. Signing off. Love you all.